guys. Welcome to this week's virtual worship gathering for Awakened Church. There's a lot going on this weekend. There's a lot to celebrate. Uh, happy Juneteenth, which is officially a state holiday in Virginia this year. Uh, happy Father's Day to those who are going to be celebrating that tomorrow, to the fathers out there. And uh, this weekend is also our very own Neil Donahue's birthday. So make sure you find him and wish him some love uh, this weekend as well. Before we jump into the worship element for this week's video, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, the last you heard from us uh, as a awakened leadership for what our plans were for reintegrating public worship gatherings back into our rhythms as a community uh, was that we would continue to meet virtually rather than in person throughout the month of June. Uh, obviously the month of June is almost over. So once again, be paying attention to social media, uh, uh, our Facebook, our Twitter, our YouTube. Uh, this week, uh, Later this week, we're gonna be making an announcement about what the next step is for Awaken as we continue to work towards uh, reintegrating that vital part of our community rhythms um, and what that's gonna look like moving forward. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, we hope that you guys are, are really making the most out of this series, this Love Over Fear se series. We hope you're enjoying it, but more importantly, we hope that you're really engaging with the content, that you're discussing it and unpacking it in your families and your missional communities, and that you're taking the challenge steps that are given in each video. Uh, these are going to build on each other, and so we really encourage you, uh, if you really want to be serious about what does it look like to be the church in this cultural moment right now, that you're taking those challenges uh, seriously and that you're practicing the things that we're encouraging in this video so that we're not just uh, learning for information, right, but we're actually seeing transformation in our lives. So uh, we hope that you will do that. We are looking forward to learning alongside you and uh, God bless. Yeah. 
to our second week in the Love Over Fear series. Uh, this week, we're going to dive into a discussion about really, I think, some key communication principles that can help guide us in leaning heavier into knowing how to love well in this season where there's so much unrest and so uh, just so much uh, disunity right now going on in our country, uh, maybe um even potentially around the world, obviously, because of all the things that are happening. And so uh, I, I think Jeff did an amazing job last week of laying some foundational thoughts. Uh, I really walked away thinking about the us versus them mentality, um, the banners that I, that I subscribe to, and, and how I can begin to engage with people who look and sound and think differently than I do. 
And I think that is an important part of this, that if you didn't hear that encouragement well last week, I just want to second it, if you will, this week and say, it's important for us as believers to be able to look across our table, to look across um, the bar, the coffee shop table, uh, the Zoom meeting, uh, wherever you find yourself these days, uh, and maybe it's even in your own family. But look across the table at someone uh, that we don't always see eye to eye with and engage in active listening and engage in conversations because it's in those moments where we give the Holy Spirit the best opportunity to show up and to bring light and love into, into existence where maybe there wasn't before. The polarization of our nation, of our, our politics, of our faith, of even as simple as sports, has been growing at an aggressive rate the last several years. And as believers, we are armed with the very tools to help bring peace, to bring uh, love, and to bring hope in those moments. Something that no one else carries because God is love. And when God sent Jesus into this world, he represented that very principle of God is love through the ways in which he conducted himself time after time after time again. Not choosing to fall into one camp or the other when often presented by the Pharisees, but instead choosing to find not the third way, but really the gospel way, to find the way that God says, this is my new way of doing things. And in even the Gospel of, of John, he teaches really this really core commandment that I'm sure you've heard of before, but I want us to read it together and kind of outline a few of the points today. In, uh, in John 13, 13, verse 34, we'll pick it up there. This is what Jesus says. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. There, there are almost 8 billion people in the world today. And there are so many people who claim to follow Jesus. And I would encourage you that if you are someone who claims to follow Jesus, you understand and look into this moment and say, how can I love well so that the world can see Jesus? Not so that the world agrees with me, not so that the world comes around to my opinion on things, not so that I can fit in, but that so the world would see Jesus. That should be our end goal as disciples and as localized missionaries, we are sent into our our context, our communities, equipped with the power of love in hopes that people would not only see change, but that people would see Jesus. Because isn't that the hope? Isn't that the goal that people would see more of Jesus and less of ourselves? As believers, isn't that the aim of which we're trying to grow? Is that this entire life of discipleship for us is that we begin to look more and more like Jesus and less and less like Philip or less and less like your name? Each one of us is so different, so unique, and that's a beautiful thing. And I want to give us a statement to work through this week that I think, again, maybe should be obvious, but I want it to be something that you really wrestle with. And it's that so often right now in our culture and even within the church culture, agreement is a prerequisite for loving someone well. And it couldn't be in it, have more opposition to the gospels that we read, the truth about what love really means. That acceptance should never be a prerequisite for loving someone well. Approval should never be a prerequisite for loving someone well. Jesus doesn't say, love someone well if they subscribe to these 10 things, or if they're a part of your church community, or if they look and sound like you. 
He says, love one another, period. It's a new command I give you. It's raising the bar and it's acknowledging that there's a new way, a gospel-centered way, an upside-down way of doing things that maybe is, is different than the default that we have as human beings. And when we choose to love like this, we bring unity. When we choose to love like this, it shows respect. When we choose to love like this, it brings peace. It brings comfort. It's selfless. It puts others first. It disarms the moment. When we love like this, people see Jesus. People see things that are supernatural. And so it causes us to stop and say, hold on a minute. This isn't normal. Normally, people handle things this way, but you're choosing to do this over here. Why are you doing it that way? I, I want to introduce you to someone named Jesus who changed my life. I want to show you a different way of doing things. But if we find ourselves in the two extremes or ditches, as I refer to them in our lives, uh, uh, of conversations, then we're not helpful to the cause at all right now. One ditch is that you're going out looking for problems, right? You, you don't shy away from conflict. And, and in many ways, the ditch is that you go out looking for conflict. You go out looking for a good debate and you have no problem arguing with anyone and everyone you can. Scroll on Facebook and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Then you have the other ditch, which is people who avoid everything, essentially sticking their head in the sand and avoiding conversations. Both are sinful and not helpful. Both don't continue to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Jesus instead invites us to a new way of doing life. And he says, find wisdom in knowing when to speak and when to listen. When to ask questions and when to make statements. Jesus was regularly questioned and put into what seemed to be a corner of this or this. And really, there's only two occasions where Jesus answers questions directly in the Gospels. Everything else leads to a parable, a follow-up question, or a discussion away from where the person who started the conversation wanted it to go. Not because he was a master at getting out of the situation, but because he wanted to reframe the conversation in a different way, a Gospel way. And we've lost that art. Or maybe for some of us, we've never had that art. We don't know how to do that well. And I think this is where being spirit-led and not defaulting to our natural human tendencies is so critical. Our human tendency is to want to agree with someone, and then once they begin to agree and see eye to eye, it's in those moments that, they, that we love them well. But loving someone well is hard. At times, it's going to bring significant discomfort into your life. Because love isn't easy. And that's why Jesus says up front that the way is narrow. This isn't for everyone. Most people won't choose this route because it's extremely hard to love well. And we see that on display right now in our society for a lot of us for the first time to this degree. How we choose to love people that are different and unique and and have different worldviews, different makeups, different stories than we do, is absolutely an invitation that a Christ follower should be generating every opportunity. Jesus hung out with people and followers of Jesus looked abstractly different across the board because they found a rallying cry around how we love well how we bring and usher in the kingdom of heaven to earth. And Jesus permeated that light wherever he went through the power of love. I want to read this last passage for you out of Romans chapter 12. Starting in verse 9, this is what Paul writes. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. 
love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that for the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Almost line by line right now, that can be applied. Copy and paste into what we need to be doing as believers. You're not going to agree with everyone. And that's good. That's okay. That's welcomed in the body of Christ. We are all made in the image of God. We are all created by one Father. And understanding how we bring love and light into these conversations when we disagree with people will absolutely be the mark of Christianity in this season. If the church sits silent and doesn't do anything, we find ourselves in a cultural sin yet again. If the church chooses to look combative and angry, we'll find ourselves in the midst of a cultural sin again. But if the church can choose to wisely find the middle ground of active listening and speaking when needed, if the church can find ways of loving well and bringing unity and peace in moments where there seems to be no hope, where there seems to be no opportunity for unity. We will introduce people to Jesus that never knew he even existed. People know Christians, but do they know the real Jesus? This is a chance for us to bring that into light, to be carriers of the good news. So as you continue to look for ways to grow and develop, if you continue to look for ways to eliminate those us versus them camps and mentalities that we have, I wanna encourage you to not be silent, to not be combative, and to remember that acceptance, approval, and agreement are not prerequisites of the kind of supernatural love that God calls us to. We love all. We love, period. And from that, we generate healthy conversations. And there are going to be times where we say we agree to disagree, and that's a good thing. That's okay. Whether that's from within the body of Christ or outside of it. But... The mark of the conversation should always be one that says, I love you. I care about you. I want what's best for you. I'm elevating you and your, your opinions above my own by active listening, by not waiting around for a rebuttal. But I'm choosing to speak love in moments where there seems to be the complete absence of love. This week, I want you to discuss a few things within your missional community and within your families. The first question, I think, is, is really about that principle we talked about this week. Why is it so often that we connect agreement as a prerequisite of love? Why is it that we naturally default to agreement being 
a prerequisite for loving someone well. Secondly, James calls us to confess our sins to each other. There's power in that. And uh, I'm going to ask you, it's been pretty bold this week, maybe take a moment in your missional community where there is safe space for you to say, I haven't been loving well in this situation and I need to fix that. And maybe it's with someone within your family, your missional community, um, but more than likely it's probably someone outside of that space. And so by confessing that it's something that has been brought to your attention that the spirit has convicted and challenged you in owning that with each other and then taking steps forward is important so where is something in your life right now where you as you kind of look and examine the landscape of conversations that you haven't been loving well and then finally if you haven't done last week's action step do it <laughs> But as you're engaging with people in conversations, what's one thing you can do to cognitively remind yourself that love is what's needed in that conversation? How can you actively bring love into that conversation? And what's one way that you can bring that into your consciousness every single time you're in those discussions? What do you need as a trigger, a reminder that love is what's needed in that moment? That you are a follower of Jesus, a carrier of love. I hope this encourages you this week. I hope it challenges you. And most importantly, I hope that you take the words this week and you find moments of loving each other well that you represent the body of Christ well, that you represent awakened church well, that you represent the gospel well, and that the world begins to see something changing because of your actions and your words this week. We'll see you in missional communities, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Take care.